Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Possibility Podcast. I'm your host, Mel Schwartz. I practice psychotherapy, marriage counseling, and I am the author of the book, The Possibility Principle, the companion to this podcast. I hope to be your thought provocateur, and I'll be introducing you to new ways of thinking and a new game plan for life. I've got a great guest lined up, so let me introduce her to you. Her name is Laura Wild. She is a sports metaphysician, and she works with pro and elite athletes and coaches. She blends holistic healing, mental resilience, and flow state mastery for top competitors. She's written several books, and she created sports energy medicine as a modality to help athletes move past their limitations, injuries, and emotional blocks. She has most recently studied epigenetics energy medicine, and she uses this and quantum medicine as a foundation for her work with athletes and coaches. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. What do you mean by flow? When I say flow, what I mean is getting into a place where you don't know you're in a place, right? Where you feel connected with everyone and everything. And for me, I usually use flow with athletes, right? So it's like that blissful feeling where I can only make my shots because I'm really gone to a different realm. I would say, you know, infinite possibilities, are, you know, exist there in the flow state. I interviewed someone yesterday. This episode will be playing um, after that episode as where we were discussing synchronicity and synchronicity. We were both describing as a state where we get out of our own way. Um, it's we're not in an ego state of oneness. We have to remove that thought of separation to come into oneness or into flow. Do you see it that way? I do. I feel, I feel like the synchronicity, you know, when I have a day that's in synchronicity, it means I wasn't overthinking it, right? I wasn't attached probably to certain things. And to me, the days that I have most synchronicity are the days when I didn't overschedule myself when I allow, I do allow space for flow. So Mondays are, are my most synchronistic days. I, I refuse to schedule anything on Monday. I don't know what I'll think. The weekend might bring me new ideas. And so I can meet people spontaneously, but I end up with so much synchronicity because I allow, you know, as you and I like would call it uncer- uncertainty. <laughs> so I'm allowing for uncertain things that happen on Mondays and they're going to be magical. By having nothing scheduled, your thoughts are not focusing on future moments. It's allowing you to be present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love Mondays. Like who loves Mondays? Me. I do. (laughs) Okay. So um, I had read that the Native American uh, tribe, the Hopi Indians, had no words for past, present or future because they didn't break out time that way. They were present. But their expression for what we would call future would be letting come. And Mm -hmm. I was teaching that concept. and People ask me, what does that mean, letting come? I said, I suspect what it means is not being bridled by our own thoughts, by our anticipation of what we call future, and inviting the future to come, which would look like synchronicity and flow, right? It's like being in the current, but letting the current take you wherever it will. Right. You know, I've heard that as well, but I didn't know that they said letting come for the future. But it's really beautiful because... That does not include the word anxiety. <laughs> and so I, I feel like it's an art to, to learn how to be present. And so it's one of the things I work with athletes on the most. You know, how can you be present when you're shooting a game or a game winning potentially shot? And what I had them do is I said, well, there's still pressure, but I want you to perceive it as joy. So let pressure show up because you can't, I don't know that we can really fully escape it and live in the material world, especially in sports, right? So I had them perceive it as, wow, this is an opportunity to be in the joy and not be attached to whether they make the shot or not. So maybe I'll have to use that, letting the shot come to you. <laughs> yeah, letting, letting it come, releasing the ball and letting, letting come, embracing the flow. But coming back to anxiety, I make a distinction between stress and distress. 
I teach that stress is good. Stress is exhilarating. It's the excitement. But when stress turns to distress, that's fear and that's anxiety. Any word that starts with D-I-S is a negative. It doesn't, <laughs> right? it doesn't work out well, right? So when you're working with athletes, and if they are struggling, I suspect periodically they struggle around stress, distress, anxiety, fear around performance. Or if they're in a slump, how do you assist with that? I do the old school thing, which is let's focus on what you're grateful for so that you can take some of the thoughts off of yourself. I mean, because to me, it's like if you're stressed, you're in your head about something. And so I have them tap into the heart, which is usually starts with gratitude, right? Even naming people. Who are you grateful for? What are the people you're grateful for? But I also have them visualize a moment that would feel great. Because, you know, I really believe our subconscious mind can be easily repatterned. And you talk about this a lot in your book, how there's pure potentiality. So if we're, we're in a state of distress, we probably have forgotten the pure potentiality of the next moment. And so I have them look for like, what magical things can unfold today? Because even, you know, something simple like, wow, the Uber showed up three minutes early or whatever, those little tiny things that we tend to forget about, I think are the ways to start embracing new Mm. possibilities for the next moment to be better. I don't think you have to wait for it to be better next week. You can be better in the next moment. There's a page in your book early on where you talk about that pause, that response. And that was what kind of lured me in. I have to know who is this guy? He's talking my language. (laughs) If we're speaking about the same thing I wrote, I wrote something like this. In the nanosecond between our thoughts, we exist in a state of pure potential. Now, how do we access that nanosecond? Well, one thing is we develop the ability to see our thought and quiet it and not become the thought. If I don't become my thought, then I am wiser. I am above thought. Thought happens, but there's a me that's more than my thought, right? So I would imagine when you're teaching gratitude, you're working with someone and let's suppose he's on the foul line and tensing up before the pivotal shot and you might instruct him to just feel gratitude wow look where i am how blessed am i to be here (laughs) to focus on that not the outcome of the shot right well and i also you know think that by the time they get to that free throw right if i've been working with them i've really trained them up to what i call the supra mind s-u-p-r-a so that it's beyond the mind right And one of the ways I have them remember that is I say, just imagine you're like a little tiny basketball angel floating above your head. So don't be in your body in those stressful moments. Be beyond the mind, beyond the body. Just become the witness. So witness yourself playing basketball or baseball so that you're not in it, right? So you can be an instrument, right? So I, I say, be an instrument and surrender. So let me be the cello, not the player of the cello, because the cello is not getting nervous when it's time to play at the concert because the cello surrenders to creator. That's a, a great thought. So how did you come to develop the, these analogies? You, you're teaching people to be transhuman, to rise above your physical being. Yeah. How yeah. did you come to that? And even metahuman, I believe a lot of this came from sitting for 10 days in silence at Vipassana. So I've been a meditator I've been doing all the spiritual inner work, but I felt like I wasn't getting where I wanted to. So I signed up unknowingly. I didn't know what it was. It sounded really cool. Free vegetarian meals every day because I don't love cooking, but I love eating good food. And Mm -hmm. it's quiet. You don't speak. I was like, no one's going to talk to me for 10 days. You don't bring your phone either. And so I signed up and they're like, yeah, you get your own room. It just sounded phenomenal because at the time I had some roommates. I was like, I'm going to get away from everyone. And I kind of went like with an attitude, but you get there and for 10 days, you literally don't speak. You don't make eye contact. And it was a brilliant way for me to kind of unpack my thoughts and to become aware of what my thoughts were doing to me. Like I noticed that my thoughts were causing all of my hip pain. And, you know, on day seven of being silent, I was really angry, (laughs) but all these great thoughts were coming through. I had started to make way and I noticed that in an instant, I had this old memory of a really stressful, traumatic time. And all of a sudden the, the pain left. And so from there, I think I just noticed there's a lot more behind the junk. And I started to tap into you know, a higher source of thinking. So really it was just being quiet. 
and sitting and meditating. I didn't know they'd make me meditate like 16 hours a day. If I had known, I wouldn't have signed up. (laughs) Well, that's that's why they didn't let you know. (laughs) So I guess what you're describing then is the visual that comes to mind for me is you learn how to access your energy and help others access their energy and not sublimate that or get distracted by thoughts, ego, and fear, right? That's what you mean by flow. You and your energy are as one. Right. I think there's this version of me who is more talented, (laughs) kinder, and more fabulous. And to me, Mm. like when I get in the flow state, that's who I become is that part of me, like you said, who isn't weighed down by the other stuff. And so flow is like meeting my higher self in a space beyond time and space, because we know that in flow, time doesn't have to exist, right? Because our prefrontal cortex stops keeping track of time. Time doesn't have to exist. and We don't have to imprint that construct of time on us, right? And and time is, at best, it's relative. But beyond Einstein's relativity, in a recent podcast I talked about the experience of the blissful experience, the experience of falling in love. And why do we experience time differently? Because we were absolutely present. And when we're not present, we experience time on a whole different level. I'd make the argument that that time actually doesn't exist. The consciousness created the notion of time to organize and order our lives. But without consciousness, is there time? Time requires consciousness. Otherwise, who's taking the measure of time? (laughs) Who made the clock? (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah exactly but there is but but there is change right so even without time there's change but change doesn't mean time is what we've labeled it like we've labeled it like left to right in the timeline and that's just the way we think about it but it doesn't mean it's true you know i think ultimately consciousness is the flow of the universe yeah and consciousness is You know, once we can all tap into that state, to me, that's where teams win championships. And when I say consciousness, usually it's interesting because then they think I'm not asleep, I'm awake. And I I, I go, well, I'm talking about like consciousness with a capital C where there's this, it's like the breath of the universe flowing through you, right? That's right. And that's how I look at it. Where we are, we are at one. Yes. With universal flow. Absolutely. Which is when synchronicity occurs. Could you talk a bit about your work using a phrase I use, and you do too, perhaps quantum entanglement. How do you employ that in your work? Quantum entanglement is one of my favorite terms of quantum mechanics, quantum physics. The way I dumb it down for myself, not for anyone else, (laughs) so that I can capture it, is basically what it means is, right, we're so connected that something I do can affect something someone else does across the land. So I've been trained in this. And it's funny, I think everyone has this skill, they just don't realize it, right? So I've been trained in remote healing techniques so that I don't have to be with my athletes. You know, when I work for teams and athletes, I can go to the game and be sitting in row 37, section 108. And potentially, this is what they've experienced and I've experienced. They hurt their knee and they can go back into the game. Like remote healing It seems really woo-woo. And I go, well, yeah, it is woo-woo. That's cool. Woo-woo is the new science, right? It's okay to be woo-woo. For me, quantum entanglement is, and I've heard one time someone said, if there's even one little tiny atom of you that's ever been with uh, an atom of the other person, you're connected. So if I walk past a person in Ply Vista, California, and then one day they're in China, then every person they've walked past in China is quantumly entangled with me, right? And so the idea right, is that we're, it's more than six degrees of separation. It's, it's far fewer than that, right? It's zero degrees of separation for all beings in, so, in some way, shape, or form. But what I've noticed is that using quantum entanglement allows me to shift the tendons or the cells in another person's you know, wrists and help it heal. And we've seen remarkable results, not only in real life anecdotal, but in studies. Do you believe that quantum entanglement could occur between yourself and someone you've never been in proximity to. I absolutely do. The thing would be whether or not I've ever been in proximity to them or anyone they know, I think it's still possible. Uh, I had a guy that worked at NASA and uh, he does mental performance training. And I said, hey, I want to work with the astronauts. And he said, 
you can heal someone on the moon? <laughs> and I said, probably. I mean, why? If quantum entanglement means no space or separation, why would the moon be too far? Just because it's far to me doesn't mean it's far to consciousness, you know? Correct. That's right. Consciousness prevails. So in that case, perhaps there is no spatial differential. It is as one. Right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm fond of saying when we talk about mind-body connection or connectivity, I object to that term mind-body connection because if there's no separation, we shouldn't use the word connection. You know, a tunnel or a bridge connects two pieces of land that are separate. If right. there's no separation, we have to stop using the word connection. <laughs> I right? agree with you. People always say the mind-body connection, and it's become a really popular term. And I do mind-body healing, but it's almost like I describe it that way because if I didn't, people might not know that I meant that. And so it's interesting, right? Sometimes our language is a reflection of our audience more than the truth, but it gets them to there, right? Like I never say I'm a healer. Because I don't believe I'm a healer. I just point to point out to your body how healed you already are. But then I'll meet someone, explain what I do. And then, you know, two days later, hey, I found a healer who can help me. Right. And I'll go, oh, interesting. Well, I never told them I was a quote healer because I'm not. I'm an observer, which heals, right? But right. they didn't understand it. And so then it's funny, you know, right? I have to change my language so people understand it. But, you know, back to mind-body connection. They are one already, right? They're, they're never were separated. They are just, they are, right? <laughs> I, I always had a picture of men wearing neckties, which I could never wear. And I thought <laughs> the necktie is so symbolic of cutting off the mind and the uh, body. But the, even then, we misuse the word mind. Right. We, where we is it? We correlate mind <laughs> to brain. Consciousness has nothing to do with brain. Right. Consciousness prevails even when the brain isn't operating. So the words matter so much. I think that's why we struggle with this paradigm shift. Um, you know, I've given talks and written articles about the two B verbs. Is, are, am, was, be, been. These are the only verbs that are inert and show no movement. So when people ask, why are we so slow in this paradigm shift, which has taken centuries, I say, because every sentence we use has a to be verb in it. It gets us stuck. We say, I am, or you are. It's fixed. It's objective. It's not in flow. So it's critical to be cautious about using those to be verbs and to say, I see, I think, I believe where we're taking participatory ownership. And I think that induces more entanglement. Fascinating. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. Because I use I am to kind of hold space without anything following that, right? I am is a sentence, you know, yes, and I think... So, which could be <laughs> yeah. the equivalent of I exist. Right. When I say I am, I kind of mean, I think I am conscious, I exist, right? And so you're right. The language is so far behind where we as humans are really like catapulting out into the universe and the cosmos to create right. new ways of living. You know, the language hasn't kept up at all. And I get a little frustrated. I'd love to show you my appreciation for your subscribing to and rating this podcast by offering you a gift to one of the following. The Power of Mind, a live talk that I gave or one of my digital eBooks, Creating Authentic Self-Esteem, Overcoming Anxiety, or Raising Resilient Children, and lastly, Cultivating Resilient Relationships. Once you have subscribed, please send an email to mel at melschwartz.com and just let me know which gift you'd prefer. Thanks. And you think about relationships. And I think about what is most destructive in relationships, the default to the need to be right. So listen to the words, I am right, which means you are wrong. How's that going to work out? So if we drop the to be verbs and said, I struggle to appreciate how you're seeing me. There's no to be verb in there. It's subjective. Right. We can communicate that way. 
I am right. That's the end of the conversation. Yeah. Big, huge exclamation point follows that. <laughs> Abs- absolutely. So is there anything new on the horizon for you? Any new ventures you're looking at? What's on your wish list? I wrote a book called The Cosmic Athlete. And a lot of people like it, but a lot of people say, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I thought, you know, I should put it into more practical terms and just call it what it is. Woo-woo mental performance. Mm-hmm. So I'm working on a book that talks something about that because I also believe, you know, like you, I believe quantum physics, when we use it, right, allows us to shift the way we live our lives. And whether or not someone believes in quantum physics or knows about it, we are always operating within its principles on one level or another. So I'd like to point out how peak performance, you know, can really shift the way we play sports and the way we achieve and the way we win. So I think that's kind of what I'm working on now. So Laura, do you work with peak performance in areas other than with athletes? Or are you busy enough that you've got as much <laughs> as you can handle? I know, I know Mondays you have no appointments. <laughs> I make no appointments on Mondays so I can live a life free and full of uncertainty. Actually, I did regular healing work for a very long time before I dove back into sports because I used to play college basketball. I was a coach and I went away from that a little bit, but then I realized I missed basketball. So I tied it back together. So yes, I work with all kinds of people. A lot of my clients that I work with are from before and they just love it because I believe I have to grow, right? I don't want to see a client for five years. That means they're, you know, they have to be growing and I have to be growing in order for that to make sense. So I do have clients that roll back through who don't like sports. They don't even know, you know, that the Lakers are in the playoffs right now. So, mm-hmm. but I, I think this work, this peak performance work can help with every human. Cause once, like once we show up as a human, I mean, just think how hard it is to stay alive enough to have a child, right? <laughs> and then for that person to stay alive and have children. So generations upon generations had to live and survive for us to show up. So we're such a rare miracle. And so I, I tell my clients, you're an athlete. You're, we're all athletes on some level, you know, because we made it here and being human. I wouldn't say it's hard, but I feel like it's challenging. And challenging for so many reasons. When Sometimes people talk about human nature in a pejorative way or critical way. You know, it's human nature. My response is we may be in our infancy if we survive. And to look at a three or four year old child and think there'll be no further development would be an error and say that's human nature. You know, so yes, from most of humankind's history, survival was the issue. Now I think the issue is the paradigms with which we think, the belief systems, egocentricity, toxic individualism, greed is what puts us all at risk, which is the opposite of the quantum inseparability. Right. We're actually three years old <laughs> with this sort of egoic living. And, you know, I used to really want to live to be 300. And now I look around and I go, well, only if I can really be part of a catalyst for change. Because when I notice how stressed out and anxious the average person is, we really need to have this awakening that happens a little more quickly. I'm, you know, I'm kind of impatient. And then I have to look and see what I can do. How can I change that? So for me, really, it's teaching people how to get into the flow state on command. That's where I put most of my time and effort. The healing stuff is great, but there are other people who do great healing. So I do that mm-hmm. with my athletes, but I don't need to be the leader on healing. It's, it's convenient to have that skill set, right? But I feel that, you know, helping people understand why getting into the flow state or the zone can change their lives. It can help them feel magical, intuitive. It helps them, you know, feel more healthy, more connected. And for me, that's kind of the little corner of the world that I'm looking to improve is to help more people get into flow. If you help more people in flow, it shifts the energy of the universe. Absolutely. That's my belief. (laughs) <laughs> you know, the the uh, expression of don't ever think that a few people can't change the universe. Only a few people actually ever have. I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt who said that. Yeah, which is we are part of the one and inseparable, but that doesn't deny our uniqueness. We can be inseparable and unique. Yeah. And I think that's an important message for people to have. And flow requires absence of fear. Right. I guess you might say, you, I've said, you can't be in flow and fear at the same time. You're doing that. Absolutely not. Right? Yeah. I don't know if it would take too much time for you, but you might think about giving some TEDx talks. 
I wanted to do one for 10 years, but I didn't know what to talk about. And I also think, well, am I enough of an expert at this or at that? Can I make it about sports? So it's funny. I'm glad you said that because that is the extra kick in the butt I needed. (laughs) Right. So that thought, am I enough of an expert? There you see the fearful limiting thought. Right. (laughs) Right. Wrong wrong question to ask yourself. So the question you might ask is, would I enjoy doing this? Actually, I would, right? I love public speaking. I want to share stuff, right? I want to share, to me, what I've come to experience as mostly inner peace. I mean, I tend to be a person who's kind of on edge, overthinking things, but because of flow state, right? I've still been able to accomplish, I always say, in spite of myself, I've been able to move beyond my tendency toward distress. And to me, if I can help other people experience that, like, wow, what a world we can create. That's exciting and all full of infinite potentiality. <laughs> right. And that's, that's the stuff of life. That's the excitement. Yeah. Right. right. That's living in the quantum field, right? That's allowing the quantum to, you know, be a vehicle, right? The idea of using, to me, using quantum tools as a vehicle is really important. I did a, a talk a while ago to a bunch of artists and mm-hmm. I said, let's take quantum leaps in life from now on. And, uh, I'm such an impatient person, right? Things move slowly. I want us to like not wait a year for the next big thing. Let's have it happen in a week or a month. And it's to me in that way, it's like, it's not shrinking time. It's leaping beyond time because I think we have these expectations that time creates this pattern. And if we can break out of time, we can leap to the the next thing more quickly. Does that make sense? I agree completely. I often... I have an issue with what I would call gradualism, slow, steady progress. And my attitude is, no, why don't we try to facilitate defining moments and breakthrough as soon as possible? Why delay that gratification? So slow and steady, obviously, sometimes that makes sense. If you're driving through an ice storm, yes, slow and steady. <laughs> but in life, why gradual? And it's because the fast vault into that progress takes us out of our familiar zone and then it creates a discomfort with uncertainty. So mm-hmm. they all, they all correlate, <laughs> right? Right. Well, and not everyone can handle the uncertainty and the discomfort. So I noticed in the MBA, things tend to move slowly when it comes to a team. Hey, we're going to rebuild so that in three to five years, mm-hmm. we can be poised for a championship. But my thought is, well, if every single player understood how they could take quantum leaps, right? Not just practice for 100 hours to be 100 hours better, but practice for 100 hours to be 1,000 hours better. If you practice in flow state, right? right? These types of things can be sped up. And just, you know, sports are very important. And then they're also not important at the same time. But yes. I think sports for me, right? It's a platform where we can see what's possible in a place where it's not really life or death. I mean, I believe the athletes are out there they're warriors for, for their game, for what they love doing. And it's really a metaphor for life. And if we can use sports as that metaphor and see what's possible, for me, that's where sports is so important. Because when people do things in sports, people who don't do sports take notice and they might incorporate you know, that stuff in their lives. So for the listeners who may be thinking, well, what is a quantum leap? A quantum leap doesn't simply mean a large leap. It means a discontinuous leap. So, in other words, it's nonlinear. It's not predictable, right? We're releasing fear and apprehension, um, cause and effect. And it's a discontinuously because from here to, oh, holy shit, how did it end up over there? <laughs> that's what the quantum leap is. Absolutely, right? And that's where I, I feel like with reading your book, you talk about embracing uncertainty. And people, I think, think, oh, that's dangerous. But to me, it allows for infinite possibilities that I may not have considered. So embracing uncertainty has always ended up really great for me because I do it fully. I'm going to embrace uncertainty, be willing to not know, but also be willing to, with PCs and Grace, experience something magical and magnificent. People worry about the consequences of their actions or embracing uncertainty, but they don't pay any attention to the consequences of our inaction. What are the consequences of what I don't say? What are the consequences of what I choose not to do? Uh, <laughs> they, they are as prevalent as the, there are two passive consequences. 
the consequence yeah. of an action and the consequence of not taking a risk and not taking a chance. That has a consequence too. It stagnates life and leads to depression and loss of wonder and loss of curiosity. Right? Yeah. For me, choosing certainty and I'm being rigid, that's, that's the more scary part to know what's going to happen every day. I don't know that the word is fear to describe that, but that maybe it is. That terrifies me. If I knew what I was going to do every day for the next month, wow, I'm the opposite, right? So my value is uncertainty far more. My brother makes fun of me because, you know, I might call him at seven o'clock at night and uh, say, hey, can you help me out? Like, hey, what are you doing? Well, I just landed and I need to rent a car. Oh, what day? Uh, now. <laughs> and right. he's like, you embrace uncertainty too much because I'm often pulling over to a rest stop to book a hotel for that night because I wasn't sure I was going to be in an upstate New York last mm-hmm. week. So, you know, this new way of since the lockdowns now, Delta Airlines allows me to cancel and rebook. I mean, my life has gotten so good that I can, <laughs> I can be uncertain about airfare and, and flights. And so, you know, I, at any given time, I have seven or eight flights. If I call into the airlines, they laugh, go, well, you can't go to these two places at one time. I go, I know I'm going to cancel them, but I wasn't sure. Do I want to go to Miami for this or New York for that? And so, you know, I live up the uncertainty, maybe more than most people feel comfortable with, but it's okay. It works for me and I embrace it. So in quantum physics, that's called superposition. The state of all possibilities exists until in physics is until we make an observation that causes what's called the wave collapse. The state of possibility gets reduced to something tangible. So you're trying your best to keep your state of superposition always at play so that you can collapse the reality at the moment of your choosing, maybe later <laughs> rather than soon. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like juggling a lot of balls. You're enjoying the juggling. Absolutely, I do. You know, it's funny you say that about superposition because one of my um, friends said, you know, you should, on Instagram, you should say, I help athletes find their superposition in life. And I thought, well, that's funny because it's really a paradox, right? Because if you find the superposition, you didn't, there's nothing to find. It, it's not quite there. And that's where I think the remote healing works, right? You want to collapse the waves. So if my ankle hurts, my ankle um, doesn't realize the possibility. So I want to collapse the waves from all five bodies, the cosmic body, the supermental, our mental and emotional body. So that the physical body kind of sees through the muck and, you know, the fear, sadness and doubt and worry to, I would say, the cosmos or the quantum potentiality of being healthy and healed. Mm -hmm. And that collapsing of the waves can be done from far away. That's where remote healing to me makes so much sense, right? Now the ankle has seen, I call it the cosmos, the ankle, the injured ankle when we collapse the wave is aware of the, maybe it's the superposition of, I could be healthy tomorrow instead of in nine months. And once we show our body parts, which are energy, right? They're pure potentiality as well. Then we can have these miraculous recoveries. And to me, that's what, you know, spontaneous healing really probably is. You know, the waves collapse suddenly and the person healed overnight and doctors go, well, we don't know why, but they kind of brush under the rug, right? Because it, it freaks out our mind. And so it's almost like, well, I don't think I saw that. <laughs> right, because we, of course, confuse our physical being with being material or matter rather than energy. So, you know, ancient Chinese traditions of energy healing don't think it's strange really <laughs> at all. In the 1960s, pioneers in consciousness studies discovered um, remote viewing. That there are people, if you could give them, they could sit in a dark room and if you give them coordinates, of a spot 11,000 miles away. And they could actually tell you exactly what was there. They could zoom into that spot. And then the CIA learned of it and they got involved <laughs> in remote viewing, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah. So the world that was turning on to acid and consciousness became an area that the CIA became interested in and we trying to. Interpret. <laughs> And also the electric guitar came around around that time. And the electric guitar as sound vibration and sound healing shifted us out of some of the fear. And so, of course, you know, yes. people didn't always like rock and roll, but I think sound will become like the defining thing that can connect us all. I think sound can guide us out of whatever human crisis we might be in right now, because sound can unite us 
but it can elevate us and it elevates us out of darkness. And not that I don't embrace darkness and those dark moments sometimes are part of what brings a bigger light, right? At the end of the day. Right. But I believe sound can really be helpful. And I've been playing around with that too. I make all my athletes get these tuning forks of 528 hertz. And it's like, look, if you're going to work with me, stuff's going to get weird. <laughs> because if it's not weird, just be like any other athlete. You know, I'm not here for mediocrity or for to be regular. I'm here for you to be a sustainable champion, right? Where you right. can continue to be a champion over and over again. It's not like, oh, this wasn't our year. No, it's always your year because you are the only thing that exists, right? And so I, I have them do these things. You know, get a tuning fork and you're going to see how it can raise the vibration of your heart or your knee. And so when they get injured, I'm training them to use these things. And so that way they feel like there's a little more tangibility, right? Because athletes really live in a material world where their body is their moneymaker. Their mm -hmm. physical world is the most important thing. But then when they tap into beyond that, to the super mind and the cosmos, they start to feel invincible. And I think that's really key is if you can be an athlete who feels invincible, that spreads to your teammates. Even if they don't know why, when they're in your presence, it's, it's, it spreads and they feel it too. So as you're describing that, here's where my thought went. Have you ever worked with two athletes who are actually in a game competing against one another? <laughs> yeah, you know what happened? I think I could cannot do this anymore. Somehow, they both got kicked out of the game in the first quarter. <laughs> my uncle was laughing. He goes, there's your quantum physics. <laughs> what a great trainer you are, Laura. We're laughing about it though. Yeah, well, there must be a phenomenon in the yeah. quantum world about what happens when two particles are in a reactive state with each other. I don't know about that science, but <laughs> that might be interesting to look into. There, there, there's so much we could talk about. And I think I, my thought that's coming to mind now is I'd like to have you back on again so we could explore other areas because it's fun pioneering in the field of energy. It is. It is. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, so often I think, wow, if I was right now, if I was 25 and interested in this, just think of where I could go. But then I go, you know, if time doesn't exist, I'm 25 now. So I use it to my advantage, Mel. Yeah. Time. Don't put, don't put an age on it. Um, right. If anyone wants to uh, follow your work or contact you, of course, I'll have the information in the notes of the podcast. But is there any reference that you want to share right now as to how people can follow your work? Well, I think the easiest way is on Instagram, which where it's Laura Mitchell Wild, because there I have a link to everything else, including I'll have a link to this podcast. Okay. And yeah. I will have one, of course, as well. <laughs> oh, and Wild has an E at the end, like Oscar Wilde. <laughs> yes. It's good Who to is know. quite an interesting character. Yes, as was Stuart Wilde, the original metaphysicist and author. And uh, my favorite book that Stuart Wilde wrote was... Um, the trick to money is having some. And yeah. then he, <laughs> and he wrote another book called Silent Power. And that book showed me, you know, how stillness can be really powerful for us to become our best selves. But I would love to talk to you anytime about all this stuff and more, because well, like I said, you're, I have two copies of your book, one for the bookshelf and one for my hand, because I'm constantly holding the book, looking at it and getting excited mm -hmm. about life again. Well, send me an email with your address and I'll send you a lot of books. <laughs> oh, and I will, I do want to really quickly mention that I send your book to general managers of NBA teams that I want to talk to. Because it's like, you guys have to read this first or you won't know a thing about what I say. No, I can see that. You're trying to platform what you're right. going to say, but read this and then you'll understand what I'm going <laughs> yeah. to say. And you did it perfectly. <laughs> I'm wrote, happy to help. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your your work and uh, your willingness to share from the field where sometimes sharing at this level gives you some extra looks. So thanks for being brave and pioneering. I encourage those strange looks. <laughs> it makes it all more fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Have a great day. Thanks, Mel. You too. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Possibility Podcast. I welcome your feedback on this and any episode. Please send me an email at mel at melschwartz.com or leave a comment in the show notes for this episode at melschwartz.com. If you like what you're hearing, please take a moment to rate and review the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Your reviews really help boost the visibility for the show, and it's a great way for you to show your support. Finally, please make sure to subscribe to the Possibility Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and that way you'll never miss an episode. Thanks again, and please remember to always welcome uncertainty into your life and embrace new possibilities. Thank you.